course, Pakistan's in the failure in Afghanistan is instigated and instigated by Pakistan. And until unless the USA doesn't take a decisive action on this, it will not solve the problem. Though, although it is very complex. Thank you very much. And if you could take the microphone this way, please. Yes, could you answer that? Right? Yeah, um, yeah, I. I agree. Real quickly, what the U.S. should do is I believe we should cut off all aid to Pakistan and declare them a state sponsor of terrorism. Okay? Very, very simple, very simple response. I, I have tremendous respect. What's preventing? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a whole different issue. Um, oh, what's preventing them from doing it? It's, it's the strategic issue. It's the strategic issue. I think that's what the fear is. And also, I mean, the United States got themselves behind the eight ball. I mean, during the anti-Soviet jihad, I mean, all of our, our, it was a large, that, our uh, aid to the Afghan Mujahideen was the largest covert aid project in US history. And we didn't know anything about Afghanistan, so we let the ISI distribute all the aid to their favorite people. And it's a long conversation. But we've made mistakes from day one because as I started my talk, we don't understand the complexity, the multi-layered relationships that, that are in Afghanistan. Now, I, I do want to say one thing. I have tremendous respect for the ambassador, and I've had for a long, long time. And when the idea of first dividing Afghanistan came up in a foreign affairs article about 12 years ago, I said it was nonsense. And I've con I continued to think it was nonsense until last year. And you know, I think that you're right. But I'm talking about having firm rules, very explicit rules, to bringing Afghanistan back together, You know that we have a set timetable. Um, and, and we have set metrics, and we eventually try to moderate the Taliban and bring them into the Kabul regime. I, and, but is, is this a certainty of working? No. I understand exactly your concerns, but I don't know any other solution. Not going to fly in Nobody's going to buy this. I know it would be difficult, but I, I, I think. It's a long, it's a long story. Yeah. Okay. Question on the front row. Uh, my name is Charanjit Ajit Singh, and I chair an interfaith organization in West London. And in that area, there are two Afghan groups. Uh, so I'm coming from that angle. Uh, it seems to me that I came here to learn a little bit and to find a solution together. And it seems like that there's quite a division within the group here. My question is that. You've talked about, Professor, about shifting the deck chairs on the Titanic. Who created the Titanic? Mm -hmm. So you, anybody can answer. Thank you, thank you. And if you could take the one to the gentleman who wrote the chair for that. Uh, why don't we get some comments from you, uh, Dr. Azami? Well, tell, us, tell us what your view is of who created the Titanic. Answer, answer. Answer. Well, well, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I will just talk briefly about the peace process. Uh, Professor Johnson mentioned uh, that in his comments. So there are different ideas. Uh, this idea of inviting the Taliban back to Afghanistan was discussed. Uh, it was not in that form that they will be controlling or ruling over half of the country. But the idea was that, OK, if they have sanctuaries outside Afghanistan, so first of all, create an atmosphere for them to come back to Afghanistan. They can live in peace. They wouldn't be targeted by the US or Afghan forces. So then that's how you can start uh, talks or a negotiation process. This has been an idea. But when we are talking about the new uh, US strategy, so their focus is mainly on war. So their idea is that we will target the Taliban, we'll target their finances, we'll put pressure on the countries that have been hosting them, specifically Pakistan. And uh, Pakistan has said about this, that we have contacts with the Taliban, but we don't have influence over them. We don't have a lot of influence, so they don't listen to us. This is their uh, official position. But the US uh, has been expecting a lot from Pakistan to put pressure on their leadership, to arrest them, or send them back to Afghanistan. So this is what the US wants from, uh, from Pakistan. Uh, but uh, the focus, as I said earlier, has been on war. Uh, they want to kill as many Taliban as possible. They want to destroy their finances. Uh, they want uh, the neighboring countries to put pressure on Taliban and uh, control or stop their movement. And they even discussed the closure of their uh, office in Doha, in Qatar. So this was another uh, pressure that they wanted to put on the Taliban. Uh, so that's the idea. 
But when it comes to the Taliban, uh, they say that we are interested in talks, but with certain conditions. So the main condition is the withdrawal of foreign forces. So it's a chicken and egg question. So the Afghan government has been telling them that if you stop fighting, then we can ask the Americans to leave the country. And they say they know we want them to leave first, and then we will talk. So then the, the, there, is a, there is a risk in both strategies. So if the system is collapsed, so we'll put it together. So that, that's the main risk. But the US strategy has been focused on war uh, for the next two years. So they want to expand their control over 80% of the Afghan territory in the next two years. So this has been their strategy. And then at the end, they hope the Taliban will be forced to come and talk to them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. My name is Dr. Shahid Qureshi. I'm a journalist here in London, sir. I've written a book, War on Terror and Siege of Pakistan, 2009. And I'm a bureau chief of Frontier Post. We are based in Bishar. Uh, Professor, I, uh, I, 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 I admire you for your bravery for coming up with uh, such a brave comments about uh, believing Pakistan should be declared as a terrorist state. But we have another state called India, who's been ter sponsoring terrorism in Sri Lanka, who's been sponsoring terrorism. A sovereign state was responsible for the uh, separation of East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, and it's recorded. Uh, they admitted it. Now I, I'd like to bring you to your own internal policy. US has 15 intelligence agencies at the time of 9-11 happened. How many people were sacked? How many were put on trial for negligence and incompetence? So your internal policy is causing problem all over the world. And Ambassador has very nicely mentioned the corruption in your system. The, the dollars coming into Afghanistan are not coming into Afghanistan. They are going to offshore safe havens. Uh, okay, in terms we're of, not putting them there. Uh, uh, as a question. And, uh, the, 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 question the question is, the, no, 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 the question is that uh, I'm not defending Pakistan here. I'm just giving you the. Hold on. So, uh, What's your question? But the, qu the, the question? The question is, the question is, the, the question we are asking is that the ethical US foreign policy in region, for example, understanding Afghanistan is the best people to understand from the British, who has been in Afghanistan for centuries. And you admitted that the US has no clue about Afghanistan. I'm waiting for a question. The question is that US has always been blaming other people for its failures. When the U.S. will start admitting its mistakes and moving on. Thank, Thank you. Professor. This gentleman here on the right. Well, do you want me to answer that question? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean, there's been many, many mistakes made in American foreign policy. I'm surely not going to sit up here and say that we're the angels, because we're not. And, you know, our intelligence agencies have done some pretty bad things. They've done some pretty good things. So, you know, I'm not going to defend all U.S. actions. But I think that the United States is generally a country that wants peace, generally wants a country to help, it generally tries to help other countries. And it's gone out of its way for a long time in helping other countries. If you just take a look at the amount of aid that we give, um, and, uh, you know, I don't like some of the aid where it goes to some of the countries, but, you know, I, I agree that we've made a lot of mistakes. But, you know, these, these notions about our aid being, you know, we didn't put our aid offshore. You know, that, that was done by Afghans. Uh, there's millions of dollars of U.S. aid that's missing. Um, there's been a lot of corruption. There's been corruption on the U.S. side, too. And we prosecuted not only military, but also civilian contractors that have ripped off the American taxpayer. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, we're an arrogant people, too. That's another thing. It's, but I'll go back to my very first statement. You know, we got in trouble very early on because of our arrogance. Um, people argue with me, but we, we thought that we could, I think the bond accords were just unrealistic. We thought that we could create a mini Jeffersonian democracy in Afghanistan that's practiced pure Greek democracy at the village level for two millennia over a four-year, six-year period when we put the roadmap together. Because we're arrogant, optimistic people. Um, uh, you know, no, so okay. we made mistakes. Thank you. There's another question. There. Yeah. This is a question for all panelists. My name is Taimur Iqbal, journalist from uh, Prime TV UK London. Abdullah Abdullah recently made an acknowledgement about TTP having a foothold in Afghanistan. It was a very major acknowledgement from the second most powerful person. Uh, 
I am a Pakistani myself, and let me be honest about this one thing. We have not really been a part of the solution in Afghanistan. In certain ways, we have been a problem as well. So an honest acknowledgment doesn't really hurt me as, as a Pakistani. So I would like to you, your, your take on that particular statement. In July 2015, Murray Accords were taking place, a breakthrough which was hailed and widely applauded by all the parties. And those Murray Accords were royally sabotaged by the deliberate news of, of Mullah Umar's death, which was leaked by Afghanistan agency, NDS. And the NDS head of NDS back then, who was very, very much against those negotiations. So Pakistan did make a very serious attempt to yeah. bring Ahmed. And just one last question to uh, Ambassador again. Durand Line, do you reckon acknowledging the Durand Line would really help uh, resolving the issue of the very porous border between Afghanistan and Pakistan? Because Afghanistan does not acknowledge Durand Line. And right from the days of President Daud, Daud in 1970s, attempts have been made uh, to go for a greater Pakhtunistan dream where instability was created in okay, Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Should I answer? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. Quickly, on the TTP, um, I have mentioned a couple of times here that we look at TTP initially as an offshoot of the Afghan Taliban. Uh, whatever the reason that they came about and how they came about, we'll leave that to experts who study that. Uh, there is a lot of um, gray, shady areas as far as TTP is concerned. Over a seven, eight or more year period, the TTP fractured into good and bad TTP. At some point, Pakistan took action and pushed some of the bad TTPs into Afghanistan and started the blame game of saying that these bad TTP fractions are anti-Pakistan and they are using uh, Afghanistan bases. Now, how much merit there is is, a, is an issue that uh, has to be uh, looked at very carefully because I can give you uh, instances of these bad TTPs, anti-Pakistan state TTP elements that have been targeted by Afghan and NATO forces. And the fact that some of them kept keep crisscrossing the border into Pakistan and coming back into Afghanistan and then making it look like they have safe havens in Afghanistan is a uh, is part of the trick, is part of the their, their um, uh, planning to make it look that way. There is no political will in Afghanistan to use or give sanctuary to any element, whether it's anti-Pakistan or anti-anybody. Uh, and I want to be very clear on this. Uh, but you know, when it comes to propaganda, anything can be said. The Duran line for Afghans is an historic issue. It goes back to the time of the British Raj. It goes back. And, and, and if you look at the diplomatic history, at least, you see that every Afghan government since independence, 1919, uh, and then since Pakistan was created, 47-48, uh, has looked at Pakistan, has recognized Pakistan as a sovereign state. We have an embassy in Islamabad. We have consulates. No, wait, wait, one second. That, that we have, we are, I'm talking about recognizing Pakistan. We have, it is true that at the United Nations, Afghanistan voted against Pakistan initially. I have looked into that. I have looked into our foreign ministry documents. I know for a fact, and I have, I have uh, proof of this, that that was a blunder, a miscommunication between our foreign ministry and our mission at the United Nations, who was supposed to say, who was supposed to not vote against Pakistan. But the message got late, and the ambassador in New York was left with no option but to think and to assume that Kabul wanted them to vote against. So it was a blunder, a diplomatic blunder. Mm -hmm. It has been proven there was a blunder. It was not done on purpose. But what I want to say is that for the Afghan people, this issue of the Duran line has to be resolved internally as part of a deliberation within Afghanistan, OK? But at the same time, we have an embassy in Islamabad. We have a consulate in Peshawar. We have a consulate in Kuwait. We have a consulate in Karachi. 
And we have given Pakistan the same rights to have okay. three or four consulates in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Right, what I'm going to do... Uh, no, hold on, hold on. The same, the same number that you have, how many, how uh, how the, how same how number, the same number, the same number, the same exact number. If, yeah, the same Thank exact you very number. Much. If you could wait until no, you, you're, you're, on you're wrong. Right, we've got about five minutes left, and I've got three Many questions. I've done this as fairly as I can on geographic distribution and intensity of request. So um, that's all I can do. And I'm going to have three here one, two, and the lady in the red at the back. So, first of all, you, sir. Um, I just wondered if um, you would reflect, with the panel would reflect on the state of the Taliban at the moment, because uh, we, there's a great deal of talk about the Taliban, but one gets the impression that it's not as unified a movement as it was some time ago. There are other armed groups coming up in Afghanistan. There are also signs that in some areas, Taliban themselves are fragmenting. I just wonder, do you think that the Taliban actually um, can be brought to the table as a unified movement and can deliver uh, any kind of peace settlement, or has that become something which is actually a bit more problematic now than it would have been some years ago? Okay, Doug, you hang on to that one. Yes, your question. Um, thank you very much. My question is virtually continuation of what um, David said. Is that Taliban lives and active with the help of Arab nations? Millions of pounds they come to them, and they keep them alive. And those Arab nations are friends of America. And you mentioned America wants peace. You can see that you just go to Yemen and see that if they want peace. Thank you. Saudi Arabia is the closest friend of the United States of America. They feed Taliban for us, and they feed those people, you know, to kill Yemenis. Yep. You see, so there's not really... Thank you. Got it. Yeah. And then just one more at the back, the lady in the red there. Hello, my name is Levina Tandon. I'm a journalist. I'm feeling very depressed. I just want to know what is the glimmer of hope? Please, what do you see as... Because um, Pakistan's or India's stability depends on each other and Pakistan, Afghanistan's stability depends on Pakistan. Where do we see this vicious circle ending or breaking? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Right, can you deal with the um, Taliban unity? Can they, can they be dealt with? Well, I mean, Taliban are not as unified today as they were until three years ago. Because after the death of Mullah Omar or, or after the announcement of his death in 2015, uh, there was um, some disagreements within the Taliban, and a splinter group emerged under the leadership of uh, Mullah Muhammad Rasul. So that group calls itself the High Council of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. But the main faction which calls itself the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is still there. And that is the most powerful group in Afghanistan today. Uh, splinter group didn't get a lot of support from the Taliban, but they are active in uh, mainly in western Afghanistan. They have some elements in in Zabul province in the south of Afghanistan, but the uh, splinter group is mainly active in Farah and Herat province in the west of the country. But when it comes to other groups, uh, we have Daesh uh, uh, and then uh, Pakistani Taliban groups uh, that uh, moved into Afghanistan after the Zarbi Azab operation in 2014. So there's the main TTP faction, elements of the main TTP faction. Then there are other uh, splinter groups of the uh, Pakistani Taliban. And then uh, we have the uh, organized crime, which is working with some of these uh, militant groups. So th there are a number of groups uh, participating to the war machinery. But Taliban is still the main group, uh, the most powerful group. There are different estimates about their numbers, ranging from uh, 20 25,000 up to 50,000 fighters. Uh, so uh, when it comes to the uh, unity of command, um, Mullah Hebatullah Akhunzada is still the head. So in Taliban, they have a dual uh, uh, obedience process. One is the political leadership, uh, and he is the leader, the main leader. But they also have the bayat system, the uh, pledge of obedience. So, which is part of the Sharia. So if a Taliban is not listening to the leader, so it means they are committing some 
this is something which is not according to Sharia, so they're viola violating uh, Sharia. So it's not only violating the command of your political leader or military leader, so you're also violating certain principle of Sharia for not listening to the Amir, to the leader. Uh, when it comes to the peace process, uh, Taliban have shown a willingness to talk, but with conditions. Some of them are very difficult, uh, some of the conditions. But even if they make peace today, it doesn't mean that there will be peace in Afghanistan, because there are other groups which wouldn't be part of that peace process. For example, Daesh doesn't believe in any peace process. They don't believe in governments or borders. Thank you very much uh, indeed. I'll just give you to the professor, and then we'll end up with you, Ambassador. Yeah, I, I just let me say uh, just a couple things real fast. First of all, getting back to the Pashtun question, a lot of people don't recognize Pashtuns are the largest tribe in the world. They're bigger than the Kurds. There are more Pashtuns that live in Pakistan than in Afghanistan. So, you know, you're touching on some very important things. It's, I don't have enough time to get into all the pl domestic political implications, but the Pashtun population in Pakistan is very important. It helps drive some of their policy. The, uh, the, the Taliban are fragmented. There's no, there's no question about that. But they control more land right right now than they have ever since 2001. And Nicholson, General Nicholson, who I have a lot of support for, um, constantly talks about we're in a stalemate. Well, anybody that reads insurgency theory will tell you that a stalemate is a victory for the Taliban. So I wish somebody, I tweet this all the time, I wish somebody would tell Nicholson, you know, don't talk about stalemate, that's a victory. And then finally, the, uh, I'm not going to defend any US actions relative to Saudi Arabia and, and Yemen. Uh, Ambassador, I have, I have you down as the most hopeful. Oh, yeah. so can you... uh, I, I will try my best. I will try my best. Uh, let me just one issue that you brought up, and I, I agree with the assessments on the Taliban uh, and, and the complexity of how this fracturing is going to make it more difficult, knowing that part of Daesh is made up of former Taliban, former TTP, and foreign fighters. And so when I say that there is at some point that there is a shared worldview amongst all these different jihadi groups, if you want to call them. Um, I am not exaggerating. Uh, at some level, there is a shared worldview. And that is where they become very potent and very dangerous. Um, now, coming to Mullah Omar, which you mentioned earlier, and the fact that the peace process was scuttled, it was scuttled because we were told, the Afghan people, the Afghan government was told that Mullah Omar fully endorses and supports the talks that are starting to take place. We were misled. Everybody was misled. The Americans were misled. The Chinese even were misled. And who did this? So you know the answer who did this and why they did it. And once we found out that it was a, a lie, basically, then everything stopped. It's not the Afghans who sabotaged it. Okay. Now, let me, let me just, let me just, let me just uh, say a couple of words on glimmer of hope that the young lady brought up. I, in my remarks, ended it with the concept of a shared vision. And that vision is not just an Afghan vision, obviously. It's a vision, it's a regional vision. It's a, it's a vision where we can live together as good neighbors. We can prosper together. And look, Afghanistan is supposed to be very rich, at least what lies underground, to the tune of trillions of dollars. Everybody can benefit from this if it's handled and managed properly. We are the crossroads of so many different corridors for trade and transit and transport and energy and so on and so forth. We have a huge pool of young generation that is yearning to live in peace and to have a good life. And what are we doing? What are we doing? What are, what are some of these governments and parts of these governments doing in order to make that, real, that dream a reality? They are they are talking about it, but behind our backs, they go and they create monsters. So we need to take care of the monster first. Otherwise, millions and hundreds of millions of our current and future generation 
are in danger, in my opinion. And so this is not just a Pakistan issue. It's not just an India issue. It's not just an Afghanistan issue. It's a collective regional issue. And I hope that we can put our heads together and find solutions that take us towards a better future. Ambassador, thank you. The professor has implored me for one minute. Final comment. Yeah, I think that your question is, is very profound. And I have one thing to say. I mean, in my 30 years of dealing with Afghans, I've been extremely impressed with how pragmatic they are. I think, and I don't know how it will ever happen, but if all interlopers got outside of Afghanistan, the Afghans would solve this problem themselves. Thank you all very much. It's been a very lively discussion. Uh, we can appreciate the panel for their excellent contributions. And that wraps it up for this afternoon. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Well, uh, the Baluchistan has been a neglected issue from the world. Baluch have a right to self-determination, and the Baluch right of self-determination has been ignored for so long, and the Baluch are suffering under the Pakistani occupation, as well as as a part of Baluchistan in Iran, and they are also suffering as much as uh, in, uh, uh, Pakistan. But right now, we are talking about uh, a terrorist state like uh, Pakistan, which is become the source of the problem for the all South Asia. It's not only Baluch suffering uh, from the uh, Pakistani terrorism. Afghans are suffering, Indian are suffering, Pakistani sponsored terrorists killing the Indian. And now the situation has changed. Now the Pakistani invited China into the Pakistan. And we, as we speak, we know the Indian and uh, Chinese border hasn't been solved. It's not demarcated. And uh, China is not in rush to uh, make demarcation on the border. Uh, Chinese waiting for that, their position in Pakistan to get uh, stronger, and then they demand on uh, India. And then the India would have been in a weaker position if the India wait for too long. India hasn't got too much uh, time uh, to wait on, on, on a, on a uh, Pakistani's destabilization policy on South Asia and backed by the Chinese money. Hey, Muru Bhai, how are you? Okay? Good to see you.